Good evening, everyone, and welcome to my Ikoria Lair of Behemoth's initial review. I'll be grading the cards that have just been revealed out of five with no specific scale, you know, general numbers. I'm going to be focusing on standard. I'll put a limited rating out there because why not? Um, as of filming, we've only got the first round of spoilers, but in this video, I'll be going over everything that's been revealed so far. Lastly, before we jump into it, I just want to say that some of these new cards, their names haven't been revealed yet. A bunch of the cards in this set have a normal name and a Godzilla name. So if they only have their Godzilla names out, that's what I'm going to be using. Might sound silly, but let's jump into it. Okay, before I talk about Nethroy, Apex of Death, I should probably explain what Mutate does. So what happens is you can obviously play it as a creature, but you can also play it for its Mutate cost. If you do, the abilities of the card that you're casting get added to another creature that you control, you can choose which one it is, and you can choose if you keep the parent toughness of the creature you have already, or if you're going to use the parent toughness from the creature card that you're mutating from your hand. In terms of uh, mutate triggers like the one on this card, it will trigger when it comes into play. It won't need another mutate card to work. So Nethroy is a baseline 3 color, 5 mana, 5-5 five five with death touch and lifelink, which is a pretty good base. For 7 mana, whenever it mutates, you get to return a number of creatures from your graveyard to the battlefield, up to a total of power 10 or less. I'll get the unexciting part out of the way. As a 5 mana 5-5 five five with lifelink, yes, it's, you know, it's good on the ground to fight aggressive decks, but most people will be looking straight at the mutate ability. Um, a great way to utilize it would be to use zero power creatures. There's no limit to how many Gilded Goose that have zero power. There's Incubation Druid with zero power. Blokronos technically has zero power. I'm not going to go through every card with zero power, like one power, but you get the idea. More commonly, I think the main use will probably be just turning one or two big things. A proposed play pattern would be like, you know, cast Cavalier of Thorns on turn five, fill the graveyard, and then cast this, return the Cavalier, and return a few other creatures as bonus. Doesn't really matter what they are, you're getting value anyway. I'll give this one probably a four out of five for limited and constructed. Um, it's probably the card that I'm most excited to play with and build around, because I think it'll make for dynamic games of magic, but I could definitely see not being able to fill your graveyard with enough creatures and also have one in play to use the mutate, so we'll have to see. Brokos, Apex of Forever, is a little less exciting. It's a 5 mana 6 ick with Trample that you can mutate, and you can also mutate it from the graveyard. I only really see this one being useful if a game gets really bogged down, um, it won't really be useful against the Fires of Inventions deck that will just overrun you by then. The most common game plan, I think, will probably be to mutate onto like a Gilded Goose so you can swing for six in the air with Trample. But we already have Uro as a recurring threat. We already have Hydro Crisis as our, like, you know, big flying monster. So I don't really see it as having much use. As always, it's an, you know, undercosted mythic rare monster. So it's probably going to be unbeatable in limited. Um, but he's going to get a 1.5 out of 5 in standard for me. I acknowledge that there's a decent chance he could be useful if you could mutate onto him with a double striker. But I'm pretty sure there's not going to be a mutate card with double strike. Snapdax Apex of the Hunt is a 4 mana 3 5 with double strike, and when it mutates, you get to deal 4 to something and gain 4. It's risky to think of mutate as similar to Enter the Battlefield. Unlike Siege Rhino, which you always get that 3 damage, it's not so versatile that you'll get that. 3 damage, especially if you don't have a creature out already. That being said, if you're playing an aggressive or mid-range deck, I can't imagine you will ever win if someone does resolve Snapdax, untaps, and then mutates a second one onto it. Although I don't think there's a deck currently that can use it, it's getting a 2.5 out of 5 for me, because I think that it could be a powerful role player if it comes around, but currently I don't think it really would have a home. Vadrock, Apex of Thunder, is a 3-mana 3-3 three, three flying with First Strike, which is impressive for 3-mana. It can mutate to cast stuff for 3 with mana 3 or less from the graveyard. I was going to give it a really low score, until I realized that it was non-creature card, not instant or sorcery. Uh, I very much look forward to using this to return, say, a Teferi or a Narset. My main issue is that for it to work, you need a creature in play to mutate onto, and a non-creature card in the graveyard to recast, and to not be super far behind on board, which isn't really common for all those to line up. The main place I think that it would work in this current standard would be maybe in a Hero of Precinct 1 deck. That kind of deck normally has a large number of cheap multicolored non-creature permanents to reanimate. Just note that you can't mutate onto humans such as the tokens from Hero of Precinct 1. Vidrock gets a 2.5 from me, the body is good, 
I mainly just think the recursion ability will be hard to use. Zilortha, Strength Incarnate, otherwise referred to here as a uh, Godzilla, is the buy box promo. Um, they normally don't push these too hard. I can't remember the last time that we had an aggressive buy box promo. Fundamentally, it's a 5 mana 7 7 trample. Has a unique effect, but 5 mana 7 7 trample is not enough. Gets a 1.5 out of me. If you could get it in limited, which I don't think you can, it'd be a 4 out of 5. Luminous Broodmoth is a 4 mana 3 4 flyer, and when a creature without flying you control dies, you return it to the battlefield and it gains flying. Unfortunately, if you wanted to really gain value from Luminous Broodmoth, you would need a decent number of creatures without flying that you wanted to have the trade off in combat, while the Broodmoth itself survives and doesn't get into combat. I don't think that's a reliable game plan, unfortunately. It'll be difficult to do in Constructed, gets a 2 out of 5. In Limited, not only do all your stupid flying monsters return, but they also come back with flying. So, as usual, it's an undercosted flying monster, unbeatable and limited, 4 out of 5. Vivian is a 5 mana planeswalker that comes in with 3 loyalty. She can plus to make a 3 3 beast with an ability of your choice out of those 3. Or using her minus when you cast your next creature, you can search your library for a creature with lower converted mana cost and just put it straight into play. She also has the passive ability that lets you look at the top card of your library and you can cast a creature if it's there. To evaluate Vivian, I have to reference the other 5 mana green Planeswalker in Standard. Nissa, you play her, you untap a land on the next turn, you cast a giant Hydro Crisis, you know, draw an absurd number of cards. In comparison, Vivian will come into play, hopefully survive, and then on the next turn you minus her, and you cast a moderately sized Crisis, shooting out a moderately sized Kaiju monster from your deck. In terms of card advantage and pressure, I don't think that she'll be able to take the place of Nissa. I do think she's a good card, she'll see play, mainly being able to tutor out niche cards like Nine of Autumn. But she'll definitely live in Nissa's shadow. I'll give her a 2.5 out of 5. As always, it's a planeswalker and probably unbeatable and limited. Next up, we have Kolga, the Titan Ape. Obviously, a King Kong reference. Kolga is a 6 mana 7 6 that fights something when it comes into play. When it attacks, you get to kill an artifact or enchantment. You can pay 2 mana to return a human specifically to give it indestructible. This card, unfortunately, is a big miss for me. It's big, sure. I just don't think it's going to fight on the same axis as all the degenerate stuff that I've been talking about in the first half of this video. Kolga's only going to get a 1.5 out of 5 for me. Um, for limited, probably, you know, 4.5 stars. It's a gigantic monster! You can't beat those. Luca, Coppercoat Outcast, is the other Planeswalker we have today. 5 mana, comes in with 5 loyalty, ticks up to 6, which is pretty high. The plus gives you card advantage, but only if Luca stays in play. Otherwise, the cards don't do anything, which is pretty concerning. Luca's Minus lets you exile a creature, flip cards to get something bigger, which is pretty good, but it doesn't do anything if you don't have a creature in play. So neither of those abilities will do anything if you get disrupted, which is a big issue for me. The ultimate is pretty unexciting, I doubt that would come up too often, obviously it's just a kill. Looks like a fun card, but for standard constructed it's a complete miss for me, continuing the trend of uh, cards that I don't think will be good in standard, but are complete bonkers and unbeatable and limited, as Planeswalkers usually are. So 1 out of 5 standard, 4 out of 5 limited. Wait, it gets how big? Idaro, the Wandering Monster, is a 7 cost 8-8 eight, eight, with Trample and Haste, which is under-costed for that if you want to think about it that way. It also has Cycling, which is a returning mechanic, which means you can pay 2 mana and discard it to draw a card, which often has bonus effects tied to the Cycling. For Idaro, when you cycle it, you shuffle it into your deck, the fourth time you cycle it, you jam it straight into play. Other than paying its mana cost, which is honestly pretty reasonable for an 8-8 Trample Haste, I could see the card playing out in two ways. First is in a control deck, early game you cycle it, later on use cards like Thassa's Intervention to find it specifically to try to cheat it out. The second way is in a ramp deck that just wants to, you know, hard cast it. The fact you can cycle it away is just bonus. It ends the game real fast, it's a big meme, but who doesn't love memes? 2 out of 5 standard, 3 out of 5 limited. Crystal Giant is a 3 mana 3 3, and at the beginning of your combat it gets a counter that it doesn't have already out of all the counters in the current set. I have no idea how people are going to randomize this, but let's go with it for now. Um, in standard, even if you knew it was going to survive for 3 or 4 turns, I don't think it would be very good. In Limited, I think this is going to be absolutely bonkers. I'm excited to see all the memes, where it's 5 for all 10 turns, as every counter on it. Um, it has to be a 1 out of 5 constructed for me, but 4 out of 5 for Limited. It's a colorless, so it can probably go in every deck. 
Alright, next up we have the Phoenix. The Phoenix is a 4-4 flying. You can also pay 4 to mutate it, which will make the mutated creature a 4-4 flying. When you do, you get a feather token. So when that creature dies, obviously the Phoenix will go to the graveyard and sack the feather to bring it back. A 4 cost 4-4 four, four flying isn't winning any awards for Constructed. Giving another creature flying, you know, it's fine, but I don't think it's going to be enough to see play in standard compared to at least like rekindling Phoenix or the Phoenixes of the past. I'm going to give it a 2 out of 5 Constructed. Uh, it's an undercost of flying monster, probably unbeatable and limited, 3.5 out of 5. Next up is Aluna, Apex of Wishes, which is a 5 mana 6-6 six, six flying tramp with upside. What is it with the giant monsters with incredible stat lines in the set? When it mutates, you flip cards until you hit a non-land permanent and put it straight into play. Generally with cards like this, you always think of all the absurd things that could happen, but usually Aluna will probably be one of the more expensive cards in your deck. I usually like to envision hitting a Gilded Goose or something basic, rather than thinking of the best case scenario. Still, I think you could build your deck around it with a minimal amount of permanents that aren't required, maybe, you know, Planeswalkers and cards like Beanstalk Giant. So I'd say probably standard 2 out of 5, but I'm still excited to see if it'll work if you build around it. Sprite Dragon being a blue-red 1-1 haste that gets bigger when you play spells, it's a little bit more pushed than the kind of cards we've seen in the past. Um, aggressive creatures like this have been really neat because you get a small amount of creatures and a whole bunch of cheap spells and jam them in a deck. Pretty hard to balance, but overall can come out pretty good like the Delver decks. There's definitely potential for Lightning Storm, Kin, and Sprite Dragon to be the core of a blue-red deck, but we'll need to see. Currently, I'm giving this a 2 out of 5 standard. I'll give it a 3 out of 5 for limited. It's not hard to make this a 2-2 two, two, or 3-3, three, three, but we'll have to see. The next cards I'm going to review are the companion cards. Now, these ones, if you want them to, they can start it in your sideboard. You can reveal one at the start of the game if your deck matches its condition. And if it does, you can play it from outside the game once. For instance, for Karuga, if my deck has no cards with cost 2 or less, I'd be able to cast it. For Karuga though, the restriction of not being able to play any 1 or 2 mana cards is a complete deal breaker. 0 out of 5, for Constructed definitely. Regardless of what the ability was, I would not give it a different rating. In Limited, I think it could be a good card, but only if you actually put it in your deck. Don't try to play this for its companion cost, your deck will suck. Umori the Collector is a card, you know, it's better. It's too restrictive to be played as a companion card, being able to only play creatures. In Limited, you can sometimes play all creatures, so you know, it could be good, but I would still recommend putting it in your deck. I wouldn't recommend using it as the companion cost. <sighs> Lutri, you poor thing. 3 cost, 3 2 flash. When you play it, you copy something. The companion cost is you can only play it if every non-land card in your deck has a different name. And it has already been banned in Commander, because you will always be able to have it if you're playing a blue-red deck. Lutri, I don't think, will be any good in Standard. But in Limited, I think that this is very good for both if you have it in your deck, and also very good if you use it for its companion cost. I would say that this one, so far, has been the best one for Constructed. Hopefully they'll reveal more of them. Lutri, I would give a 1 out of 5 in Standard. Probably a 3 out of 5 in Limited, maybe maybe 3.5 out of 5. Lastly, we have Gyruda, which is a 6 mana 6-6. Six, six. You can cast it for its companion cost if your deck only has cards with even mana costs. When it comes into play, everyone mills 4, and then you can put a creature with an even cost into play. Just note that that card has to be from the cards milled, which is awkward in terms of templating. A cool card, not designed for standard, don't put in your standard deck. 1 out of 5 for standard. Maybe there'll be some insane even cost creature that it can return. Probably pretty good in limited, 2 out of 5 for limited. Um, but that is all the companion cards, so we can move on. Alright, this uh, was going to focus on Constructed, so everything from now I think are purely going to be limited cards that are obviously limited cards, so I'm just going to do a few words on each. First is Polywog Symbiote, probably pretty good for mutate decks, it'll depend on what we have in terms of cheap enablers, which we don't know. Giant Moth Cocoon, it looks like a mutate enabler, but literally every creature in Magic other than humans is a mutate enabler, so please do not put this in your deck. Primal Empathy is a good tool for you to get ahead of your opponent. Just note that you don't actually get both modes. If you have the biggest creature you draw, if they have the biggest creature you get a counter but not both, and the draw isn't optional, so just be careful. Pathfins is a great reprint. It's going to be a massive tilt to have your giant monster incapacitated. Naturally, I'm very excited to do it to my opponents. Essence Scatter is a great reprint, and it's going to be a massive tilt to have your giant monster countered, so naturally I'm really excited to do it to my opponents. Fully Grown, I get it, it's a pump spell that now it has a counter that gives trample, 
It's pretty novel, but 3 mana is a ton for its effect. Huntmaster Liger, pretty complicated, but I think it's mainly going to be a 4 mana 3-4, unless they have a few cheap mutate enablers, which we don't know of any yet. I don't think this is going to be as good as it looks. Cloud Piercer is an unexciting mutate enabler, not much to say. Zagoth Mamba is a neat mutate target, but in my opinion it's probably not going to be very useful. You're only going to be able to trigger it generally at sorcery speed. Minus two, minus two, you can't use during combat to get something. Like, you're going to use your mutate cards onto a 1-1 one, one vanilla. Drenith Stinger is a nice cycling enabler, but usually in the red decks you want to be using all your spells, not cycling them. Grim Dancer, I get it, Wizards. You have ability counters now. I get it. Vanilla. French vanilla. Essentially a vanilla. Void Beckoner and Titanoth Rex are presumably a cycle of five. I actually really like them. They're just big, big costs, but with a cheap cycling that gives you a little bit of a bonus. I'm really excited to play with these, obviously, only unlimited. It's the kind of card that you could play five or six copies in your deck and it wouldn't affect your ability to win the game. Alright everyone, time is up. I can see even as I'm making this that more new cards have been spoiled. Let me know if you enjoyed the video. I'll continue to review the remaining cards in the set. If there's any one card or combo that you noted that you'd like me to make a video on, let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you around everyone. Peace.